to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it matthew chapter 16 verse number 18. welcome to our study of fundamentals of the faith today we think about god's fundamental teaching on the church you read about in the Bible. We welcome you to our study of this subject, and as we think about these subjects today, we want to emphasize that our authority lies in the Bible. We simply want to turn to the Bible and do exactly what God says so that we can be pleasing to Him. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit them. If you've got a question or you want to open up the Bible and study it with them, they'd be more than happy to sit down and open up the Scriptures and let God's voice give the answer. At the Gospel of Christ, we also want to help you in any way possible in your study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of a DVD or a CD of our lessons, We'd love to send that to you free of charge. Also, you can visit our website where all our material is available on the website, thegospelofchrist.com. Please contact us if you've got a Bible question or you'd like to study the Word further. We'd be glad to help you with that in any way that we possibly can. Our information will be given throughout the lesson or at the end of it for you to contact us with. Today we think about the importance, the fundamental subject of the Lord's Church. We begin with just uh, several questions related to the church. Think about this with me. Why are there so many religious groups today? Why are there so many churches in the world's view today? Where did they all come from? How did they all get here? Do all of them belong to Christ? Do any of them belong to Christ? Or does it even matter? Does it matter? what church one goes to? Friend, these are subjects that throughout the lesson we're going to let God's Word address. And again, they're questions that a lot of people have. There's a lot of confusion and there's not the unity that Christ wants within His church. What's the reason for that and how do we solve that problem? Friend, let's begin by realizing that man's standard is not God's standard. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 12, and Proverbs 16, verse 25 says this, There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It's not what man thinks or man's standard or man's ideas that's going to be the final word. God's standard is what we must look to. Remember Jesus' words? John 12, verse 48, He who rejects me, Jesus said, does not receive my word, has that which judges him. What is it? The word that I have spoken, Jesus said, will judge him in the last day. And so let's consider, if we were thinking about something's nature, something's identity, how is identity? We're talking about the identity, the nature of the church in the Bible. How is identity determined? I want you to think about John chapter 20, verse number 25. Uh, Thomas is here wondering about the Lord, and is this the risen Savior? Is this really Jesus? And Jesus says, see the nail prints in my hand. Feel the, the piercing in my side. I am He in essence. What did Jesus do to express to Thomas that His identity really was the Savior? He said, look, see, touch and feel. Identify me and you'll know. You identify things by their traits or characteristics. The nail print in his hand, the piercing in his side. Definite, definitive answer that Jesus was the Lord in Christ. Well, what about with the church? Friend, the church that you read about in the Bible has qualities and characteristics. Its nature is clearly laid forth in the Bible. I can come to the Bible. I can see what the nature, unique identity of the church is, and I can know based off of Scripture, if a religious group 
that claims to be that church really is the church you read about in the New Testament. So let's look at the nature of the church for just a few minutes and determine if it is truly the church you read about in the Bible. We begin by thinking about who started, who founded, who's the beginner of the New Testament church you read about in the Bible. Of course, the natural answer from Scripture is Jesus Christ. Jesus started, founded, and began His church. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 3.11? Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that was dealing with a great amount of confusion. And he said, No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Who's the foundation, the founder of the Lord's church? Jesus is. Matthew 16, verse number 18, Jesus promised, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's said to be the founder. He promised to build it. Mark chapter 9 verse 1, Jesus said to His disciples, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here today who will not taste death until you see the kingdom present with power. The kingdom and the church are the same thing. Matthew 16 verses 18 and 19, and thus Jesus promised it would start. He's the foundation stone it's built on. He began His church. And friend, Matthew or Acts chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 says this, Nor is there salvation in any other name, for there's no other name given, among he given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Now, let's be practical as we ask this question. We asked, who founded the New Testament church? And the Bible answer is, Jesus Christ. Now friend, we wouldn't do ourselves any favors if we didn't ask this question. Who founded most modern religious groups that exist today? Whether it be John Wesley, whether it be Martin Luther, whether it be John Calvin, John Smith, men founded and are notably identified within these groups themselves as being the founders of them. The only founder of the Lord's church is Jesus Christ Himself. Let's then think about a second and unique identifying trait about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's ask this question. When does the Bible say the church you read about in the New Testament, when was it founded? Well, according to Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse number 44, Daniel prophesied that during the time of the reign of four kingdoms, God would set up an eternal kingdom which would never be destroyed. Now, we from history know what those kingdoms are. You've got the Babylonian, you've got the Medo-Persian, you've got the Greek kingdom, and the Roman kingdom. During the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Greek kingdom, the God is still reigning through Israel. No new kingdom has been set up yet. And then Jesus comes on the scene during that fourth kingdom, promises His kingdom be established, Mark 9 verse 1, and identifies the church as the kingdom. And the words of Acts 2 verse 47 say this, And the Lord, for the very first time, added to the church daily, those are being saved. When did the New Testament church begin? When was it founded? In that fourth kingdom, as prophesied, during the Roman era. Colossians 1 verse 13, Paul said to the Christians in Colossae in the first century, God had translated them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Did the kingdom exist in the first century? Absolutely it did. People were in it, according to Colossians 1.13, and Paul was preaching it as a reality. Matthew or Acts chapter 28, verses 30-31. through 31. Again, another practical question begs our asking. When did most religious groups today have their start? Most of them started just in the last two, three hundred years. Some of them maybe go back as far as five, six hundred years. But you know what? The Bible, the church of the Bible, started in the first century. It started during that Roman time period. And friend, if a religious group did not start according to the blueprint of the Bible, was not founded in the first century, just as Scripture prophesies and reveals, can it be identified as the church of the New Testament? 
Then a third unique characteristic about the church, we ask, where did the Bible say? Where does the Bible say that the Lord's church would start at? And of course, Scripture reveals to us. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, God prophesied that His house would be established in Zion and that all peoples would go to it. Well, God already had a house during the time of Isaiah, so we know He's looking forward to a, a future event that's going to come. Not all people, only the Jews went to that. What kind of house is this? Well, we learn a little more about it as we open our Bible to 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. Paul said, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Prophecy, Scripture prophesied. The church would be founded in Jerusalem. That's where Zion was, according to Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3, and Micah 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul mentions the church as that house of God, and when you open to Acts chapter 2, exactly what was prophe prophesied is what occurs. They have killed the Messiah. Peter now stands up with the eleven and proclaims, This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. The Bible says they're, they're cut to the heart. Why? They realize they've killed their own Messiah and they cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter responds by saying, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Verse 38, Those who gladly received His word were baptized. Verse 42 following. And then listen to verse 47. In Jerusalem, just as was prophesied for the first time, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Friend, where did most religious groups begin at? Most of them began in England or America, thousands of miles from the place the New Testament identifies as a trait of the church. If a religious group started in Springfield, Missouri, Brooklyn, New York. When the Bible says the New Testament church would begin in Jerusalem, can it be the church you read about in the New Testament? Friend, those are clear identifying traits that we learn about the church. Now, let's address some other ideas that relate to this very fundamental subject about the church. Who does the church belong to? Well, we naturally realize the church belongs to Jesus Christ. He's the owner and He's the founder of His church, right? I want you to look in your Bible in Matthew chapter 16 at verse number 18 with me. We've mentioned this several, several times, but I want you to see the clarity with which Jesus spoke about His church. Matthew 16 verse 18. Jesus said, And I also say to you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Who's the church belong to? Jesus did not say, I'll build John's church. Jesus did not say, I'll build John the Baptist's church. He didn't say, I'll build Martin Luther's church. He didn't say, I'll build John Wesley or John Calvin or anybody else's church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And friend, that is so essential to understanding the unique nature of the church. The church only belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, let's make that practical. If the Scripture reveals that the church does belong to Christ, whose name should it wear? Well, just take an everyday illustration. Let's say that you buy a home and you go down to the bank, you make a loan, you buy a home, you pay that off, the deed's signed over, it's yours. Whose home is that? Are you going to put your neighbor's name on the deed? Are you going to put your best friend's name on the deed? Who does that house belong to? You. You paid the note. You paid the price. It was your sweat and tears and blood that purchased that house. It belongs to you. Why is it different then for the Lord's church? Well, of course it's not. Acts 20, verse number 28. The Scripture says, Christ purchased the church with His own blood. He shed His blood on Calvary for the church. It belongs to Him. Now let's make it really practical. If the church belongs to Christ, whose name ought to be on the deed? The church 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not some man, not some religious act, not some newfangled idea that people may have today. The church of the Bible belongs to Christ. If Christ said, I will build my church, and you replace the my for whose church it is, whose would it be? I will build Christ church. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 16, verse 16, Paul said, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Friend, as we think then about Christ's church, there's another very important principle and unique identifying trait that we want to look at from Scripture, and it's this. Today, you go out into the world, you go out into any community or town, and you're going to see a multiplicity of denominational groups. How many churches does the Bible say God has? And friend, I hope you listen very carefully. We're saying it in love. We mean it with all kindness. We want people to go to heaven. But the Bible plainly declares Christ has one church. Now, let me illustrate it to you. I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 with me. Let, let's look at that from our own Bible. Does the Bible teach Christ just has one church? It absolutely does. And I want you to see from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. The Bible says, And He, God, put all things under His feet, Christ's feet, and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Now, from Ephesians 1, and 23, we notice Christ is head of the church, and we notice the church is also called His body. Body and the church are used synonymously for that same group of believers who've obeyed the gospel and are now part of God's family. And so that's equated together, body and the church. Now, flip over in your Bible to Ephesians 4, and I want you to look in verse number 4. The Bible records, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. How many gods are there here? One. Does one mean one? Absolutely. How many lords? One. Does one mean one? You bet it does. How many Holy Spirits? How many just means one? Now look at Ephesians 4, 4 again. There is but one body. Now remember, if the body is the church, according to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and there is one body, Ephesians 4, verse 4, how many churches are there? God only ever built one. Jesus did not say in Matthew 16, 18, Upon these rocks I'll build my churches. Not what He said. Upon this rock singular, I'll build my church singular. The church of the New Testament is singular in its identity. It belongs to Christ. He Himself is the head of that church and it is unique in that way. Now friend, we also want to illustrate from the Scripture that the confusion, the division, and the denominationalism that exists today, it was never a part of God's plan. Denominationalism is contrary to the will of God. I want to direct your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to look in verses 10 through 13 with me as we think about denominationalism being against what God wants. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, now I plead with you, brethren, Paul speaking by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you all be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Does God, from this context, want division? I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Listen now, let there be no divisions among you. What is it that, that God is trying to get across here? The seeds of denominationalism had some of their beginning right here. What do we mean by that? Some are saying, yes, I'm a part of that, I'm a part of the body, we just like Paul, and so we're followers of Paul. 
Well, we like Peter or Cephas. We can relate to him. I'm of Cephas or Apollos was an eloquent man. Yeah, we're part of the big body. We're just followers of Apollos. We're Apollos Christians. We're Cephas Christians. We're Paul-like Christians. What did the Bible say about that? Let there be no divisions among you. Now, friend, I want you to listen real carefully and think real practically with me. If in the first century it was wrong to be a follower of Paul or Cephas or Apollos, how can we call ourselves by men's names today and think that's right? Martin Luther wasn't trying to make Lutherans. Uh, when we think about John Smith, he didn't want his people calling themselves Baptist. Where do all these names come from? Uh, John Wesley, was he trying to make Methodist? That's not the idea. Are men's names to follow those, to name the religious group, is that approved by God? Let there be no divisions among you. Friend, denominationalism was wrong in the first century. It is at the heart and core of part of the problem in Corinth. And it's just as wrong and creates division today. And so, let me ask you to think about this. What church would the Bible alone produce? Think about that for a moment. If we just took the Bible, we don't know anything about Reformation history, we don't know about Restoration history, and that's not important because this is our judge. If I just took this book and this book alone, and I went to it and I said, I'm going to be a part of the church you find in this book and this book only, what church would come out of this book? Could you just take the Bible and get a Catholic, or a Baptist, or a Presbyterian, or a Methodist, or a Lutheran, or a Mormon church? Not in there. Could you take this book alone and get the Lord's church? Jesus said, I'll build my church. Matthew 16, 18, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the church that you find within the pages of the New Testament. Now, let's then think about this as it relates to the church. What would these people inside the body, what would they call themselves? Would they call themselves by denominational names? In the New Testament, it was called the church, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. In the New Testament, it was called the church of God at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. It is called the church of the Lord. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. It's called the churches of Christ, congregations, churches of Christ in Rome. Notice the thing that binds all these together. Church of God, church of the Lord, church of Christ. All those names, who do they honor? Who do they bring glory to? God, the Lord, Christ. That's who the church belongs to. And so that's what the church was called in the New Testament. Now, let's think about it even more practically. What would the members inside that body call themselves? How would they be identified according to Scripture? They were simply called Christians. Acts 11, verse 26. They were called Christians first at Antioch. Who does that name honor? Well, you can't say Christian without saying Christ. It brings honor to Him. They were disciples of Christ. Acts 20, verse 7. The disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Disciples of who? Learners. Disciples of Christ. They're called children of God. 1 John 3, verse 1. The Bible identifies us as children of God. We're God's children. We're servants of God in Christ. Romans 6, verse 16. We're servants of Christ. We're called brethren. 1 Corinthians 15, 6, the family of God. Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16. Again, you don't find these denominational names attached in the Bible. All you find, Christians, disciples, servants, members of the body of Christ, those are names that bring honor to God and to Christ and leave men out of the picture. God's the one who purchased the price. He's the one who paid the ultimate debt. And He's the one deserving of our honor and our glory. Now, as we think about this idea, there's another very important question that uniquely ties to the nature of the church, and it's this. What doctrine would people who followed the New Testament church follow? 
Well, you can turn to the Bible and clearly see. They follow biblical doctrine. Acts 2 verse 42. It is said of the New Testament church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. And so how do we know God's church is the church of the New Testament? Are they following what the Bible says? Let's just say somebody has a name up that says Church of God. Can I be 100% sure that they're doing what's right in that group? If when we go in, we find they're following the Apostles' Doctrine. Are they staying true to the teaching of Christ? Are they worshiping God in spirit and in truth? John chapter 4, verse number 24. Are their lives being lived to the honor of God every day? Are they living like they ought to live? When they pray, do they pray to God? Do they not bring things inside God's house that are not right and approved in His sight? And so, friend, we encourage you today to think practically about the identity of the church. Can one look in the pages of this book and find out what the church is? Absolutely. Jesus said He'd build it, Matthew 16, 18. It belongs to Him, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. It is not a denominational organization. And friend, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ brings honor to God in what it says and does. And so we ask you today, are you a member? Are you a member of the Lord's church? Just simply the church that you read about in this Bible. Friend, I understand that some of these things may not be popular. I understand that some of these things are maybe different than what someone may have heard before. Please listen carefully. We're saying these things because we love you. We want you to go to heaven. We want men and women everywhere to go to heaven. Our motive in speaking about the church and against denominationalism is so that people can go to heaven. If Christ is coming back to take His church home with Him, and He is, 1 Corinthians 15, 24, it's essential that men and women be a part of that. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you today to become a Christian. If you'd like to learn more about God's plan of salvation, please write to us and we'd love to study the Bible with you and may we always do everything possible to glorify God in His church. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.